Hi, everyone. Um, so that, that was really interesting, really interesting. It's really lovely to be here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about something that's kind of slightly different to what I'm used to talking about. So I've actually written it on my phone, which feels really kind of modern and weird because I'm going to be talking about stuff that's kind of a bit, I don't know, old school, um, and I'm doing it on a new school phone. Um, so <laughs> I, has anyone ever had this problem? You know, you've got so many clothes but nothing to wear. Um, I feel like I suffer from it uh, quite, quite severely. Um, I saw this image uh, a few weeks ago whilst I was lying in bed, scrolling through Twitter uh, mindlessly, as I do, uh, to try and get myself to sleep. Um, but that's a whole other issue. I know I shouldn't bring my mobile phone into my bed. Um, but this image caught my eye. So obviously I clicked on it and I read the article. Uh, and the artist behind these images are, is an artist called Libby Oliver. And she said that we justify our consumption as a means to define who we are, to describe ourselves, to communicate to others what's underneath. But at what point does the line become too blurry and the things take control? So <laughs> this image... You know, obviously, it made me think about my own consumption uh, and my own relationship that I have with my stuff. Um, they say that the average person has approximately 140 items of clothing uh, in their wardrobe. I know I have far more than that. Uh, and of the huge quantity of clothes I have uh, stuffed in my wardrobe, my chest of drawers, under the bed, now in my loft, um, <laughs> I realise... I needed to uh, I need to address it. Uh, so I started to think about you know what what would I look like piling all of my clothes that I owned or owned me onto my body. Um, <laughs> these are the kinds of thoughts I have when I'm going to bed. Um, and how long would it take me to gather all of the clothes that I own together from all the various places that I'm storing or maybe hiding it, um, to be able to do this. Um, I don't think I've seen all of the clothes I own in one place at one time. Um, how heavy would it be to wear all of the clothes that I own? Would they suffocate me? And just thinking about it, it started to kind of bring on these sort of heart palpitations. Um, in the last 10 years, the amount of clothing that people buy has increased by a third we're buying more stuff, but we're not wearing more stuff because we can't, you know, just look. I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? Um, we also don't wear about a third of our wardrobes. In fact, in the last 12 months, that that's, that's the figure that they say about a third of our wardrobes are unworn. So we're hoarding, um, you know, and I justify all of this, my hoarding. I'm completely conscious of it. Uh, and I'm completely conscious of it when I'm talking to you about sustainability uh, and my own issues. Um, <laughs> it comes from a very personal place. Um, but, you know, I hold on to things because maybe one day they'll fit me uh, and I'll hold on to things because, you know, there's memories that are embedded in them. And then I wondered if the artist was in any way inspired by that episode of Friends, you know, when Joey puts all of the... <laughs> clothes, I love China's clothes on Tim. Anyway, um, <laughs> social media is great for stumbling across things like this. Um, it allows us to connect with like-minded people with similar views. Some might argue it becomes a bit of an echo chamber, uh, luring us into this sort of false sense of security that we're all the same with all the same views. Uh, it's also the perfect breeding ground for feeling social pressures uh, to not only be constantly advertised to, but to feel like you're being judged as your wardrobe choices are documented and scrutinised by all. But if anyone was to look at my Twitter feed, they would maybe start to believe that ethical and sustainable fashion is mainstream. You know, so if sustainability is in, uh, as I'm hearing through the ripples of the internet, my carefully curated world online, then why aren't more people buying more ethically made clothes? Uh, perhaps because we feel less pressure to change our behaviour if it's culturally appropriate. So, for example, our peers shop ethically, so we're more likely to do the same as, as them. Um, and if they don't, then we won't, because the risk of changing is minimal. You know, as long as we can curate what we see um, and curate our own content, 
There'll be a small voice inside motivating us to stick with what we already know, avoiding facts that are inconvenient to our world uh, worldview or make us feel uncomfortable. So, asking people to give up things, obviously, because uh, sustainability does, does that sometimes, uh, makes them uncomfortable. And, and what we're seeing, especially in the West, is these sort of material, materialistic attitudes uh, that are strongly linked with rising anxiety levels, a higher use of antidepressants, uh, and less sophisticated relationships uh, between people. We fail to be critical of the things that we want to believe in. Uh, and so hearing about the social and the environmental injustices in the world of fashion is too bitter a pill to swallow. And perhaps we're trapped in a cycle of self-medicating through fast fashion buys. Um, you know, we need to truly understand and engage with the things that we buy and understand how much we really need. And this is the difference, want over need. Because um, according to the WWF, we're using 1.7 times the, uh, Earth's planet, uh, the planet's resources, its natural resources. Whilst clothing production has doubled from 2000 to 2014, and we are now globally producing over 100 billion garments a year. Uh, and yet we're not wearing more clothes. So our relationship with our stuff is not sustainable. We need to fix our relationship with our clothes. So I work for a charity called Trade, a textile reuse charity. We're in a very unique position to see the broad range of garments at varying stages of their life. Uh, it gives us an insight into the physical and the psychological factors that come into play when we're discarding our clothes. So clothes with gentle wear, clothes washed a few times, so maybe discoloured, uh, stained, shrunk, uh, or pilled through poor design and planned obsolescence. You know, are mixed up with clothes that are worn beyond being recognisable as a garment, um, alongside clothes that maybe have a missing button or a small hole uh, that maybe the owner was didn't know how to fix or didn't have the time to fix or the skills to fix. Uh, and, you know, increasingly, we're seeing garments with the shop tags uh, still attached. I call that misguided purchases. Um, but we're left guessing why an item of clothing might be considered waste and discarded. Um, naturally, it's all subjective. You know, one person's trash and all that. Um, but at trade, it's up to the clothes sorters in our warehouse in Wembley in North London to decipher what can be worn again. And then it's up to all of us to imagine its past and reimagine its future when we're buying, wearing, using and passing on our clothes. Have you ever considered that the average person might... <laughs> might not find the tonnage of textile waste as intriguing as you. Uh, <laughs> you know, a great deal of environmental messaging doesn't work because it's boring. It's inaccessible. I feel like I can say this because I've been talking <laughs> about these problems for 12 years. Uh, and I see that kind of slightly hazy uh, kind of, like, kind of, blank expression or the, the when I talk to people about the problems. You know, we have a finite pool of worry whereby, you know, we can only handle so much bad news at one time. So perhaps it's not helpful for me to talk about, I don't know, water consumption of cotton, about problems with microfibers, problems with uh, pesticides in cotton and the links with you know, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and, you know, child, uh, child labour, uh, bonded labour, sexual harassment in the workplace, you know, blah, 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 incineration, landfill, whoa, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to, to think about. Um, so instead, what I want to do is I want to try and offer some possible solutions. Uh, and I feel like that's how we need to talk about uh, sustainability. Um, so this recurring question that I'm asked often, uh, in light of all of these social and environmental problems, 
is, Sarah, where should I buy the clothes? Where should I buy my clothes? Tell me where I need to shop. Um, you know, when faced with a problem, it's only human nature to want to be a part of the solution, obviously. Uh, you know, but the truth is, we cannot buy our way out of the problem. Sorry, we can't. Um, you know, my response to anyone who asks me the question about where they should buy their clothes, I often say to them, just buy something that you love. Buy something that you're going to get a lot of wear out of. Um, you know, my opinion, if we consider that there are so many clothes that already exist in the world at any one time from an environmental angle, secondhand is currently widely available uh, and offers an alternative consumption. Uh, it requires no new, new resources. It ticks lots of the boxes. So you could say it's a circular approach to buying and discarding and it's happening on every high street in the form of charity shops. Uh, you can buy secondhand, you can wear secondhand, then donate it back when you no longer need it, and then someone else can buy it and wear it, and it's just beautiful. You know? It sounds perfect. Um, but we know it's not because of planned obsolescence and poor durability of clothing. There's this great documentary, and I, I'm conscious that this is going to make me sound like a kind of wacky conspiracy theorist. I do like documentaries. Um, but there's a great documentary called The Light Bulb Conspiracy. Um, has anyone seen it? Yeah, great. Um, it was a real light bulb moment for me. <laughs> um, so there was, this, there, there was this, this light bulb in a fire station in America. Um, and I'm not going to ruin it, so do watch it. Um, I won't tell you what happens in the end. Um, but basically, this light bulb in this fire station in America had been working for 100 years. Still, still lit up. And the manufacturers got together, and they realised that they'd never make any money if they made light bulbs to last forever. Uh, and so planned obsolescence was born. Simple. You know, we know that... Single-use plastics are bad for the planet because it was highlighted in, in, the, in Blue Planet 2. Very recently, we're seeing waves of people that are getting on board and reducing their plastic consumptions from bottles to straws. We also need to channel the same anger and frustration with single-use clothes and clothes that are failing us, being designed for, uh, for the bin uh, very, very quickly. Um, so we know that recycling and we know incineration is not the answer. Um, you know, recycling is great, but we need to be reducing, we need to be reusing, and we ultimately need to be repairing as well. We need a better relationship with our stuff. So uh, there's also the fact to address that although most people are happy to donate their unwanted clothes to charity for reuse and recycling, and I talk to people all the time, they feel quite good about it. You know, they're not throwing their clothes in the bin. Fantastic. Um, but not everyone wishes to shop in charity shops. So then we have this problem. We've got all of these clothes in these charity shops and nowhere for them to go. So we need to understand why people don't buy or wear secondhand clothes. And I talk to people all the time, and I've collected lots and lots of data, and I don't really do anything with that data. But essentially... Uh, notions of cleanliness comes up as a recurring uh, factor as, as, as to why people don't wear second hand. They don't know where it comes from because they know where their new clothes come from. Um, then uh, if someone, they, they, there's this idea that if someone's decided it's rubbish, then it must be rubbish. So why would I want to wear something that someone else doesn't want to wear? It must be rubbish. Um, there must be something wrong with it. <clears throat> and then, um, then this, other, this one comes up well, quite often with teenagers, actually, is someone must have died in it. Um, <laughs> they were just ripping clothes off of dead people's bodies. <laughs> we're not. Well, <laughs> that'd be weird. Um, so our Second Hand First campaign was launched about five years ago to tackle overconsumption. 
um, you know, the elephant in the room, uh, and to also encourage this circular approach to clothing and to challenge the stigmas of second hand. So the pledge was designed to allow people to think about what they have, how they buy, and how they can adopt a more slower, more thoughtful approach to sourcing the things that they need to make a positive change. So this could be borrowing from friends and family, buying from charity shops, vintage shops, uh, eBay, Debop, wherever. Um, uh, taking your clothes to community clothes swaps, um, and it could also just be repairing what you already have, uh, making it last longer. So the basic idea behind pledging is that if people make a commitment to something positive for society, uh, sorry, yes, are they more likely to do it? Can citizens be encouraged to adopt behaviour that benefits the collective good? Let's find out. Uh, <laughs> in 2014, the Second Hand First Pledge turned into this annual week of actions and storytelling to coincide with Black Friday. I'm sure you're all aware of uh, Black Friday. Um, it was a perfect time, in my opinion, to encourage people to share their stories and to build a united and strong voice around the country and online to celebrate the benefits of secondhand whilst retailers were you know, slashing their prices and trying to whip up a frenzy and encourage people to buy lots of stuff that they don't need. Um, I love things like that. Just, uh, anyway, um, So I got in touch with... Uh, other organisations and individuals around the country um, who I believe share the same values as trade, uh, who perhaps maybe run upcycling or repair classes in their local community, maybe they do clothes swaps, um, and to pull our audiences and voices together and work collectively to promote second hand. Um, so also by using the power of social media, we were able to start to challenge the stigma of secondhand and instead celebrate the diversity of people uh, that enjoy it and the creativity that comes from it and the unique styles that all help to gently loosen that grip of advertising and corporations on shaping our own identities. But, you know, after a few years, I wanted to understand whether the pledge, which could be taken online or in person, holding up a board and choosing your number, um, made any difference to the near 300 people that had decided to try and take control of their buying habits and their wardrobe. So, at the end of 2016, so two, two years after launching the pledge, uh, I decided to contact the people that had taken it and ask them a few questions. And I wanted to see whether the pledge had promoted this sustainable behaviour and had given these people any incentive to change their buying behaviour uh, away from mindless fast fashion consumption uh, to something slower and more meaningful. Uh, this is the first time I've publicly revealed these results because when I got them, uh, well, you'll find out. Uh, so I sent the survey out to almost 200 people. 30% responded. So not off to the, the best starts. 95% uh, considered the environmental impact of their clothing more since taking the pledge. So I was like, oh, fantastic, that's great. You know, we're, we're increasing awareness. People are thinking about the environment when they're shopping. They're not thinking about, you know, what their clothes look like and price. It's all about the environment. Great. Um, 87% had shopped in charity shops more since taking the pledge. So I was like, oh, brilliant, people will buy more second-hand. 81% found that taking the pledge was easy, uh, and 58% felt that they could up their pledge to source more second-hand. I was like, oh, fantastic, this is all really positive. However, 78% of those that took the pledge were already shopping in charity shops. Oh, <laughs> which made me think, are we just preaching to the converted? Um, so all these years of kind of thinking, oh yeah, you know, we're changing people's behaviours. You know, I was quite defeated, if I'm honest. Um, on social media, 
I keep going back to social media. But on social media, we follow people with similar interests and views. Uh, you know, we often share similar views with our friendship groups. So the people that took the pledge are already supporters of charity shopping and secondhand, and they just want to maybe reaffirm their existing values and feel a part of something. And then I read that we don't often tell the truth in surveys. Ah. Oh. What's the point? <laughs> um, there's this thing called the social desirability bias kicks in. So with our need to present ourselves in the best possible light, you know, we, we're not, we don't always respond accurately. Um, so what I learned from the survey was to maybe not trust the survey, um, which would explain why people say they would buy more ethically, but maybe aren't. What I did enjoy finding out was what the pledgers enjoyed the most and the least about trying to source more second hand. So unsurprisingly to me, people enjoyed the experience, uh, the creative challenge of second hand, the hunt, uh, the unexpected, um, the variety, the freedom of style. Uh, they also enjoyed saving money, um, which shouldn't be the only incentive for buying second hand, but you know, who doesn't love a bargain? Um, and they also felt good, this kind of feel-good factor of shopping guilt-free and with a clear conscience. Interestingly, the things that pledges liked the least was addressing size and fit issues uh, and, take, and it taking longer to find particular items, um, especially things for specific occasions, so like sportswear or work attire. Um, having to mend or alter things before being able to wear them was another thing that people, pledges, didn't enjoy. Um, and also this missing out on new, the guilt of buying new, because obviously some people did pledge and uh, still bought new, obviously. We all need new pants, don't we? Um, and the guilt of not buying new. So, oh, I'm not supporting uh, independent designers. I should be buying new. So should be supporting people that are working in the garment industry and doing positive things. So then there were some answers that made me wonder if people just feel quite overwhelmed and confused about sustainability. Um, is the issue too big? So I do believe that we're in danger of alienating most people who don't possess a postdoctorate in sustainability or critical thinking to swim through the sort of murky waters of uh, Brand's corporate social responsibility report or the jargon, um, the, the promises that they're making you know, to be able to weigh up whether or not to purchase something from them. So when we're buying clothes, we buy because of price and aesthetics. We do not buy an item because it's more ethical or sustainable. We just need to consider when the Rana Plaza factory collapsed in 2013, in Bangladesh, it implemented Primark, uh, as well as other retailers and brands. Um, However, it didn't impact on their sales. In fact, Primark reported a 20% increase in sales three months after the collapse uh, that killed over 1,100 people and injuring many more. So many of us choose not to engage because it makes us feel uncomfortable. Uh, but what we must also understand is that the problem is political uh, and global, and we must engage with the issues as citizens and not as consumers. And you've probably heard that uh, a few times before. So one of Trade's charitable objectives is to offer the UK public the skills and the knowledge to make more sustainable choices. So to try and be part of this solution, uh, we need to do it collectively. Um, a trade this is done through formal and informal education and to different audiences, so we have to adapt our, our language and our approach. Often capitalising on uh, most young people's interest in fashion, we're able to raise awareness of the issues surrounding the production, consumption, disposal of clothes, and we create a space to explore and discuss solutions creatively and critically. However, we need to embed sustainability and... <laughs> well, I've got five minutes. <laughs> I've got so much to say. 
Um, we need to embed sustainability and, and uh, creative and critical thinking rather than treat it as a standalone topic. Uh, ex it exposes to the risk that if a student doesn't enjoy a project, they switch off and they don't engage with the issues. So, we need to motivate people to be curious, to seek out information that maybe contradicts what we believe or makes us feel uncomfortable in an open-minded way, uh, and to interact with others that maybe share a different point of view. Um, I believe that sustainability and ethics in the classroom is important to shape values, uh, so we can ask questions of provenance, uh, ask questions of organisations, um, and you know whether or not we go on to work in industry or, or just to, to be a consumer of, of a company's products also to empower young people and also to understand that we can be part of the solution as active citizens. Um, now, education has changed a lot since the years when darning samplers were taught in school. <laughs> Learning the process of mending was common in women's education to prepare them for the future, uh, their future domestic chores, whether as a housewife, a mother or a wife, uh, or housekeeper even. Um, so this, I brought along this book today. This book was from 1946. It's called The Practical Home Mending Made Easy uh, book. Um, and as most sewing-related books of that time, it's rooted in gender stereotyping. Um, so I thought I'd read you a little quote. <laughs> uh, a mere man, question mark. <laughs> yes, the book is for you too. <laughs> Uh, you needn't must master all the information in it, but if you concentrate on a few essential pages and become expert in button sewing, patching, button sewing, patching and darning, and you can, you, <laughs> you can, men, you can sew, uh, you will have the admiration of all your girl and women friends and be as independent as you please. <laughs> How we've moved on. Uh, times have changed. Um, but I wanted to kind of very quickly talk to you about some of the solutions. Um, there are lots of problems in, uh, in education and government education policies that are stif stifling creative subjects. Uh, we've seen a fall in um, students taking uh, creative subjects. Um, you know, certainly when I was at school in the early 90s, my chemistry teacher described art as wishy-washy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, need to, we also need to persuade parents that there's value in a creative education. But why? Why do we need to do that? Because creative industries is important for the economy, absolutely. Uh, but we need creative thinking and problem solving to solve the issues in sustainability, the issues that we're facing. Uh, we need to understand how something is made, then perhaps maybe we'll value it a bit more. So repair skills that were once passed down through generations and taught in schools is no longer the case. We're time poor, we lack the skills and confidence to sew and repair. It's cheaper to replace and buy new. Uh, these skills are not valued in education. Uh, so, you know, as a result, we're losing these very, very precious haptic skills that come from doing these crafts. And we're also, uh, and, and certainly in the Craft Council's research, we are, um, the, they have spoken to industries such as dentistry and surgery that require those haptic skills that aren't being taught, those fine motor skills that aren't being taught. So, solution, how can we ensure these vital skills are not lost? Hey, repair cafes. Um, Repair cafes are free mending spaces for people to come and to learn how to fix broken things from their toaster to their uh, bike to their favourite pair of jeans. And they are run by volunteers that are itching to share their skills and empower people to have a better relationship with the things that they own. Because owning something comes with responsibility. Repair cafes are the brainchild of Martin Postama, a journalist and local politician from Amsterdam started repair cafes, and now there's about 1,256 repair cafes around the world. So a number of people that come along to repair cafes with a story of a bad experience, usually in school, um, has put them off of sewing and perhaps even developed into a bit of fear. Um, 
we have, and I feel quite mean doing it, but we have a very strict rule that we do not do the clothes repairs for uh, ourselves to ensure that people come away learning a new skill uh, and hopefully are able to carry out that repair again in the future. Um, a repair cafe works by people signing their stuff in, uh, diagnosing the problem and then assigning them to a volunteer. So what you find is you never know who's going to turn up, what they're going to bring, and, and, and sometimes even how to fix it. It's quite often a, a fun game of hacking and problem solving. So you never know who's going to turn up, but what it does do, which I think is really important, is it strengthens the bond between the item and the owner, and the person is potentially less likely to throw the item away, or at least they will tell me that because of social desirability bias. Um, um, so typically the main reason that people come to a uh, repair cafe, certainly with clothing, is because of poor design. So uh, for example, uh, there's broken seams and holes, we call it the, pl the planned obsolescence I talked about earlier, uh, when maybe the fabric's worn out. Um, and then it's followed typically by alterations and fixed uh, alterations uh, and, and fit issues. However, by extending the life of a garment by an extra nine months reduces its environmental impact by 20 to 30 percent. So, 77 percent of those asked our clothes repair workshops said that they would keep the item that they had mended for at least another three years. Brilliant. With a third of people stating that they would keep um, the item for more than 10 years which is fantastic. Now, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I have learnt my lesson on social desirability bias. Um, I am aware that people will tell me what I want to hear. Um, <laughs> but when we're tackling consumption, it's not a quick fix. Uh, we need to understand what drives our consumption. We need to try and challenge ourselves to form a different relationship with our clothing uh, and not put so much pressure on ourselves to conform or to look a certain way and ultimately to make sure that we fix our clothes when they're broken. So thank you. Sorry. I